All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, just to give you a little bit of introduction uh, just to myself, my name is Christina Young, and uh, I, my background is in bioinformatics and computational biology. Um, I started working at OICR several years ago. Um, I stayed there for eight years doing different kind of analysis uh, in pancreatic cancer, uh, colorectal cancer, and also uh, got very much involved in the Peacock project that you've heard about uh, yesterday. And I'll dive into more details. And then last year, I joined uh, University of Chicago, and uh, I'm now uh, leading the project called the NCI Genomic Data Commons. So I'll tell you about that uh, as well, because these are both very big data, uh, data sets for cancer research. Um, so uh, we'll talk about Peacock in a bit more detail, and then um, because I was doing the technical work in Peacock, I want to tell you about some of the lessons we learned uh, in some very tough way. So hopefully when you plan out your own cloud analysis, uh, you hear about these lessons and don't run into the same kind of issues. Um, so we talk about the data sets in ICGC and Genomic Data Commons, and there are also multiple cloud resources available for your uh, big data analysis, so I wanted to touch on that. And uh, at the end after, uh, of uh, Module 11, actually after Brian's uh, lecture, we'll do a, a tutorial so that you can actually write your own um, common workflow uh, around a Docker, so you can actually run one of the PCOT workflows. <clears throat> so ICGC, I believe um, Francis already had gave you a bit of introduction about how this project started almost 10 years ago with the goal to collect 25,000 tumors at, um, with match normals. So there are um, currently, wrap, this project is currently wrapping up, um, and there are Altogether, 107 projects uh, from 17 jurisdictions that have committed more than 29,000 tumor genomes. And this is all spread across the, really around the world, uh, with the exception of Africa not, not participating. Um, and so for the ICGC, like having this much data, uh, it requires a lot of data coordination. Uh, planning was done way, way ahead. So having just sequencing data doesn't help you. You need metadata, clinical data. So as you can imagine, with that many projects, the clinical data is very diverse. It's, you have different terminologies that may actually mean the same thing. So the DCC was responsible for harmonizing the data, coming up with a diction, data dictionary. They come up with controlled vocabulary so that people can submit the clinical data in a very uniform way. Uh, so data submission is important. Validation is even more important. You gotta make sure that no bad data gets into your system, otherwise, you know, trash in, trash out. Um, annotation, so annotating your gen uh, genomic variants, uh, your clinical data, that's all important. And then ICGC has a web portal that you, uh, you probably have seen some screenshots already. This allows you to search and download data. Um, and then we have also controlled access. Uh, there is a uh, data access compliance office where people submit the applications and you can um, get access to data. So one thing about ICGC is that uh, once you get uh, approved by the DACO, you can access all ICGC data. So it's not uh, just per project basis. And on the portal, there are continuously uh, development of analysis and visualization tools. Uh, recently, the ICGC data have also got into the cloud. Uh, they're on AWS. So that's why now there is some integration with cloud uh, management as well. And so, of course, help desk is very important to uh, handle all these requests. So there are a lot of data types in ICGC. Clinical data, as I said, is important. Uh, there are also mutations from both uh, so germline and also um, uh, somatic. 
And then these are, um, so for somatic mutations, they are open access on ICGC. So you don't have to get uh, DACO approval. Germline, of course, because they can identify a, a patient, those are controlled access. We also have copy number, uh, structural variations, gene expression, microRNA, exon, uh, DNA methylation, protein expression. So uh, a very diverse data types uh, within ICGC. And this is how the data has been growing uh, over the 10-year uh, period. So um, we are now at uh, 20,000 donors in total that have been sent to the DCC. Some of them don't have molecular data yet, meaning that the submitters have sent in the clinical data first, but the sequencing uh, variants haven't come in. But we do have over 17,000 uh, donors with molecular data. So the, we hope that this will, uh, the, there's a couple, I think there are two more releases of the data and we are aiming to hit that target of 25,000. So um, as part of the ICGC effort, there was a benchmarking uh, group um, and basically they discovered that these are germline, uh, sorry, genomic variants submitted to DCC, but they're analyzed by the project owner themselves. So they use their own pipeline, they use maybe different uh, alignment algorithm, and they definitely use different variant calling algorithm. <clears throat> so this benchmark working group discovered that did an analysis and said there's actually a lot of variations from method to method. So when you try to combine multiple data sets, like might say multiple lung cancer data set, to find some meaningful uh, variants, you're hoping that by combining, you get a, a better power. And you actually see variations that are due to the technical um, variability of the pipelines. They're not true biological variations. So um, in order to um, really enable people to use these large data sets, combine multiple cohorts, uh, we need to do uniform analysis across the data. So this is the motivation to have basically reanalyze all the data. From raw, the raw sequencing reads, we have to completely realign, you use the same variant calling pipeline for all the data. So this was uh, already done by TCGA. This was the pan-cancer analysis on uh, cancer exomes. This was published back in 2013. So for ICGC to do something new, uh, we decided to do a uniform analysis in whole genomes. So this is the pan-cancer analysis of whole genomes. We call it PCOG. Um, so at the start of the project, um, we only called out to the ICGC members to say we want to collect 2,000 whole genomes. That was our goal. And uh, we have overwhelming response. Uh, people were very willing to contribute the data they have already on hand. Uh, but it's not so easy just to say, hey, here's my data. Uh, there's a lot of work and they're willing to do it. Because uh, we came up with uh, standardized metadata. They have to reheader their BAM files with uh, correct naming conventions. It was a lot of work for them to just prep the data to submit it. But uh, in the end, we have over 2,800 whole genomes. Uh, this was really great. Um, so the project was launched in two, 2014, uh, almost four years ago. And of course, with uh, whole genomes, we can get a lot more information than the exomes. We could look at non-coding regions, regulatory elements, uh, genomic structural variations, pathogens. Um, you know, uh, we have virus inserted into some parts of the uh, human DNA. We can now look at those as well. And then mutation signatures is another interesting um, topic. And then we also, of course, look at driver pathways, driver genes. And so those, that was the goals uh, set out back then. And the, uh, this consortium is organized with uh, a five-member steering committee. And then uh, there's 16 research working groups. Uh, so basically, at the start of the project, we made a call out to the consortium members and submit abstracts. 
what would they do with this whole genome data set when it is available? So we received over 130 abstracts. So this was organized into theme with, um, so that's why we got 16 research working groups. But before the research working groups can do any research, uh, there's a lot of technical work uh, to be done. So there's a technical working group that was responsible for uniform alignment and variant calling. Um, and then we also did a lot of data curation and data check before disseminating uh, the data. So this technical working group was the one that I was very much involved in. Um, these are the 16 research working groups. Um, I, I won't read out each of them, but definitely there might be a topic that you're interested in, and I would say look out for the papers coming out of this, uh, this consortium probably later in the year. Um, so for those 2,800 uh, tumor normal whole genomes, they come from 48 projects in 14 jurisdictions. You probably would notice that the uh, projects coming from uh, United States, those are actually uh, TCGA samples. So all the TCGA uh, uh, whole genomes were also contributed into this project. Um, so many different types of cancer here. and. Um, it was basically um, a really generous contribution from different groups uh, with the data sets. This gives you a sense of um, the different um, uh, number of donors in each primary uh, site. So pancreas um, actually came from four projects. Uh, there, some of them are adenocalcinoma, some of them neurocrine um, tumors. So. These are just to give, give you a distribution of what, in the case there are specific uh, disease that you're interested in, this gives you a sense of what data set is available. So initially when we set out the, to do this, um, we basically said, okay, we'll collect 2,000 tumors, uh, sorry, 2,000 donors. We uh, received unaligned AMs from the um, data submitters. So. In general, there are about 150 gigabyte per whole genome. Uh, it's quite a large. Uh, this is about 25x coverage is the minimum that we required. Now, problem is that actually there's a typo there because this amounts to 800 terabytes of unaligned band. So it's a lot of data. Um, as I said, the data owners made a lot of effort to prepare the reads in the format that we wanted. Um, so we actually provided them a tool, we call it PCAP tool. So this allows them to submit their, uh, basically validate their BAMs locally. So this is a tool they had to set up locally, uh, is, is pearl-based, and so they get a chance to validate their metadata in their BAM file. If the data is correct, then the metadata is extracted into the form of an XML. And so that when they upload the data, at the time we we're using a server called Genos, it is uh, very similar to the CG Hub server, if you ever mm -hmm. used CG Hub uh, from a while back. So this basically allows people to submit their XML with the metadata in it and then the BAM file. So those will good, can, um, make sure that data is clean to come to us. So it's a very important part. Yes? So basically it's like a, like a fast queue, but now in a BAM format. So it's raw sequencing data. It hasn't been aligned. It has quality scores in it and everything. Yeah. Um, so we then aligned this, uh, the BAM files with BWA MEM. Uh, don't forget, when you align something, you basically double your footprint. So we have another 800 terabytes of aligned BAM. Um, alignment started in, uh, in August of 2014. And um, it was basically a continuous process. Uh, we just align them as data comes in because uh, data comes in asynchronously. You can't get everyone to get your data in uh, at the same time. So as data came in, we aligned. And then as we finished alignment, we do variant calling. So I think George mentioned to you, we ran three core pipelines. Um, so there's the Sanger pipeline, the DKF Zenombo, and the Broad uh, Muse pipeline. So uh, at the time, they, I, we didn't have a very good idea of how much um, resources these pipelines will take or how long it will take. It was very vague. Um, so we decided that we just have to do a small batches and then figure out how much resources we need. Um, along with this effort, at the very start, we also um, went ahead to do validation. So we picked out 63 donors. 
the picking was based on the availability of DNA um, and uh, also uh, a material transfer agreement that could be made between institutes. So 63 donors were selected, and then we basically run the pipeline on, um, on those 63 donors, and then we have a set of variants. Then we send those set of variants to the lab so that they can design a targeting panel um, and then deep sequence these uh, tumors, these uh, tissue to do the validation. And so if some of you are, have been involved in targeting sequencing validation, it actually takes a while um, to design the target panel, have your panel ordered and made. Um, so this, the validation process actually took nine months. And you can imagine during this time, we have already started three algorithms uh, for variant calling. We don't have a good sense of the accuracy, and we have to wait till the validation comes back nine months later to really know, have we been running really good pipelines or really crappy pipelines? Um, I was very nervous during the entire time. Um, and then using the validation data, we could now use a consensus strategy. So machine learning out methods, you apply the methods to learn from the validated results uh, what features these uh, varying calling pipelines are good at, and then now you can estimate your accuracy and then also decide how to combine the calls from three pipelines into one set of consensus calls. So that was the roadmap at the beginning, and of course, um, we, we discovered a lot of challenges along the way. Um, so as I said, having 800 terabytes of raw data and then another 800 terabytes of aligned uh, reads, that's a lot of data. No one institute at the time could host all this data. And then we also have to think about uh, bandwidth. We're hosting this data, um, if just in North America, then you know, having transporting the data or transferring the data from Asia would take a long time to North America. So we decided a strategy um, to have multiple data centers. Um, and then again, this time we called out to our consortium members who could contribute the uh, compute resources to host this data. Because one, one thing that was subtle that people may not be aware of, there was not a dedicated grant to support the Peacock project. This was just um, volunteering from the different centers that either they have the data, they have the knowledge, or the compute resource, they can donate to the project. Um, so we end up having a very good results. I'll show you um, who, the, who the data centers are. Um, but also we had to do a lot of benchmarking. We had to make sure that you know, alignment that we do at one center actually can give us the same results when it's done on a different compute center. Uh, and also when your data is spread across multiple places, well, how do you track it? So metadata is, is very important, as I cannot emphasize enough. Um, and also we use Elasticsearch uh, as an indexing tool. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. So when we start off, we have seven um, data centers. Uh, the idea is these centers uh, contribute both um, storage for us to upload the data to it, and they also have compute co-locating. So all your compute, once the files are uploaded to that center, the center can do the alignment itself. So you minimize the, the move of data. Um, so the blue line uh, is actually showing you um, how people, where the data is uploaded depending on the region. So obviously, um, in if you're in Asia, we asked you to upload to uh, uh, Korea or University of to Tokyo. In Europe, we have uh, Barcelona and Heidelberg, um, London, uh, three centers hosting. Um, at um, in the TCGA data is special because it can only be hosted at University of Chicago because this is a trusted partner of the National Cancer Institute. So TCGA data, the American data, cannot uh, leave American soil in a sense. Um, and then we have um, also the NCI cluster, that is the UCSC, again, those, that is a specialized center to deal with the uh, TCGA data. And we had a special case, though. Um, Australia, at the time, was having a very uh, slow bandwidth to any of the data centers. So Australia ended up shipping us 40 pounds of hard drive to <laughs> Chicago so that Chicago could do the upload for them. That has changed since, because now AWS has set up a center at, uh, in Australia. So bandwidth there is much better now. OK. Um, so yeah, so we started alignment there, and 
We found that um, it took about 2,000 core, core hours per donor, and um, this was done um, over a couple months' time. Um, and when we're, we st st finished alignment, when we went to the variant calling, we thought, oh, maybe variant calling would just require about the same amount of resources. Uh, but we were very wrong. <laughs> because when we tried the pipelines, um, first of all, there, there are multiple challenges. Uh, the pipelines originally were already running uh, in the production environment of the institute who donated those uh, pipelines. Um, so it works well, but now you're pulling out some pipelines um, and try to make them stand alone to run in different compute environments. So that was quite challenging. Um, so, so for example, Broad uh, Pipeline was very uh, integrated into their, their internal production uh, tool called Firehose. So pulling out all those components, uh, get them to be standalone was not easy. And um, there are also uh, specific things that you can think about. So the Sanya pipeline, for example, were very specific to how they named their read groups. So they were expecting certain things. And but now we are having get data from multiple groups. So those assumptions are no longer valid. So they had to make changes as well. Um, and don't forget one thing is also the pipelines were not completely ready when we wanted to run varying calling. They actually were in development as we were trying to run them. Um, and we've noticed that, okay, we need more compute power. Um, so we actually made a call out to um, some other um, uh, additional consortium members asking them who can donate more resources. And I'll show you that the, the outcome of that call out. Um, but there's some key changes uh, regarding cloud computing that happened during this project. Uh, when we first started, uh, data was actually not allowed to go onto commercial clouds like AWS or uh, Google. Uh, but some of our steering committee members, especially Lincoln Stein, uh, lobbied with NCI trying to convince them how how beneficial cloud computing will be and how much we need it. So there was an article, I believe, um, uh, in, in your read, reading material as well. So that's, that's one of the um, uh, convincing argument that he made. So then in March 20, uh, 2015, uh, finally, NIH updated the cloud policy and say, yes, TCGA data can go to the cloud. If you apply for a TCGA, it, there's a checkbox actually in your application asking whether you use it on the cloud or not. And that, uh, ICGC also changed that policy, allowing us to use the cloud. Um, so that changed the project a lot because now we can have a burst uh, of compute. And so um, with all those changes, uh, we also got an agreement with AWS. Uh, they are hosting the ICGC Peacock, ICGC data, not just Peacock, but they're willing to host the ICGC data set as part of their um, public data set program. So this is sort of a community uh, contribution they have. So we managed to put uh, 1,400 Peacock uh, donors in the, in the AWS bucket. And uh, so th this makes it a lot easier for us uh, to do the compute. And also, um, we also switched to using Dockers to run our pipelines. Our first few wasn't uh, Dockerized, but then uh, having the Dockers really helped us to go from one environment to another. So this is the, the uh, you may have seen this slide already. Uh, these are the different components in the three variant calling pipeline uh, to call SNVs, indels, structural variants, copy number variants, germline. Um, and basically, this is the amount of core hours that you need to run each pipeline. Um, we know that these are, uh, these are actually very ambitious, having to run on 2,800 donors. And so uh, we asked our um, consortium members for more resources, and we got really great response. So the yellow ones are the additional resources we add to, um, to the project. But keep in mind that these uh, resources only have compute. They don't store the local data. Um, so we, they will actually have to pull from the data centers that have the data. Uh, one thing we also did, I forgot to mention, is 
Uh, after the alignment phase, uh, we actually started synchronizing the alignments uh, between data centers because that would give us more flexibility on where to run the data. And also at that point, we could actually delete our unaligned, the, the raw data, because we no longer need them. And using just the aligned reads, we can uh, do variant calling. Um, so there are a couple, I just want to point out, we did use um, AWS and Seven Bridges platform. Those are, um, uh, AWS it already has the data, so it's great to use it there. Uh, OICR Toronto, that's the collaboratory that George Pry mentioned. Uh, that's where all, all the ICGC data is as well. And so this is sort of a, a very simplified view of the progress of the project. Uh, you notice this is BWMM. Uh, we started running that back in you know, summer of 2014. You see only a lag here because uh, we finished our data train one, um, and then that's our 2000, and then people submitted more data. That's a while we waited, and then we have a burst to finish all the alignment. And the reason you see that there's a stagger of starting these variant calling pipelines is because they were still under development um, at the time. So we could start up the Sanga pipeline really fast, but then uh, it took some time for DKMs and Ombo to finish the development and Broad uh, started even later. And then the reason you see these um, dips is because through, throughout the process, we discover you know, issues, QC issues with the data. So we had to pull it back. Good thing those are not major issues. It wasn't a complete rerun, but it was uh, had to be post-processed and then uploaded back to, to, the, um, to the server. So that's why you see this dips. Um, and then we also have a, a OxoG pipeline. So this is actually uh, after all the variant calling, there are oxidative artifacts in, in, the, in the reads. So that's why we have to filter some of the variants using this uh, algorithm. And uh, OxoG is actually a published tool by Broad. Um, in fact, to get good quality data, we have to do a lot more than just uh, a simple filtering. Um, we disseminated this data, the varying calls to the working groups. And we asked them, please be very critical, look at this data, tell us which samples could be bad. And it was very interesting because people looked at this data from different angles. Some people look at it from just an SNVs. So whether um, uh, some people look at it from a structural variance standpoint. So what they discover is that we, we had to eliminate some of the samples. Um, some of this simply because we don't have any clinical or histo histological information. So you don't know the disease type. So we got to get rid of it. Um, and then we also find that sometimes the tumor is contaminated with um, uh, normal DNA. So we had a cutoff of 4%. If it's more than 4% D to normal DNA, we have to cut, uh, eliminate it. And interestingly, uh, sometimes we found that the normal is contaminated with tumor DNA. And in that case, um, basically, you're sensitive, you, you have a much tougher time to find out whether to, to make varying calls. And so the cutoff here was set to 15%. And then we also have um, some excessive numbers of mutations that are already in dbSNP. So those, again, we believe are contaminated samples. And then we also found some contamination either from cDNA or sometimes in mouse. So uh, none of these samples are xenografts, but who knows when you're sequencing your machines or your, your lab, your bench could be contaminated with other samples that are not intended for the project. Uh, we also see some stru yes? How do you end up with the normal? So it's a mix of it's a mix of your, your uh, sample, right? If you're processing your normal and your tumor, at the same time, it's just maybe a pipette tip, a little bit of getting in there. Yeah. So it's not because uh, the normals are from adjacent normals? No. So the normal are mostly from blood. Yeah. yeah. So it's not because of the tumor uh, tissue itself uh, during the extraction process. It's probably during the preparation, library so prep. Yes, yeah. the pre library prep. Yeah. Um, and then we also look at uh, some extreme outliers that are based on the Q, uh, a QC working group, because if they see that um, some of your reads are, um, uh, your pair of reads are mapped to multiple chromosomes uh, at a very high level, 
and is more than possible biologically possible, then that's probably a, a QC uh, issue as well. Um, so in the end, uh, we eliminated 6% of the samples uh, for a large scale project. This is pretty standard. And then there are some samples that we listed as gray uh, because they have low level of contamination. Uh, some filtering managed to rescue the sample, but if you think that you have discovery in there, you better double check because it could be uh, an artifact. And so um, along with the, these samples, we also have um, uh, RNA-seq data. So this was all made to, for downstream analysis uh, by the 16 research working groups. Um, so those after the samples were eliminated, um, then we actually had to go through another round of filtering and annotation. So as I mentioned, oxidative artifacts were um, eliminated by uh, OxoG. We also look for PCR template bias, strand bias. Uh, using the panel of normals, we tried to eliminate uh, germline leaks. And then we also look at um, SNVs that overline, uh, overlap with uh, germline calls that are in the thousand genome project. So these are just ways to um, improve the quality of your data. Another good example is when you see chromosome Y calls in a female donor, that's probably an alignment artifact. Uh, so those are eliminated. Uh, and then annotations is important because we need to uh, help the help the, um, uh, the machine learning algorithm to make consensus calls. So we annotate things like signature artifacts um, and then also any enriched SNVs. Yes? Yeah, in the previous session, just a lot of different filters. Is there a good way to assess how many false positives you're getting up versus true positives? Yeah, so unfortunately, we weren't able to assess that even using our validation data because for some reason, what we validated was not filtered out. When we tried to run the same filtering algorithms on our validator, not much was removed. So we, we couldn't get a chance to assess that. Yeah. Um, so here's the consensus strategy. After cleaning up all our data, uh, we look at um, how to combine the calls from three pipelines. So this is, so down at the bottom, I know it's a little hard to read, is basically this is, um, this is the individual pipeline. So this is DKFZ, Sanger, uh, this is two plus. So meaning that if two or more Two out of two, two or three of the callers make a call. Then this is the kind of um, sensitivity, precision, and F1 score we get. So what you're trying to get is basically a high F1 score, or a high for everybody. But if you just want to look at one score, then F1 is is a good estimate. Uh, you want to get a high F1 score, uh, and then we try also What's some. So it's basically a combination of sensitivity and precision. So it allows you to estimate uh, how accurate your, your uh, algorithm is. So uh, these are other methods. These are uh, decision tree, stack logistic regression, uh, SV vector machine, uh, random forest. So these are fancier machine learning algorithms, you can say. Uh, this is just a simple you know, two or three algorithms calling us so in an intersection. So we decided to go with just you know, simple. So if a variant is called by two or more algorithms, that's the call we take. Uh, and that gives us 90% precision, 90% sensitivity. Yes? Your truth is from your target? Yes. This is from the validation data, yes. Uh, so, in, so that was what I just showed you was SNVs. For indels, it's a little more complicated. Uh, so if, for some of you who have looked, worked for indels, uh, if you pick indels from any two algorithms and try to overlap, well, overlap is probably only 50%. Uh, indels are tough to call. Uh, it's very tough to be accurate. So in this case, we have, um, uh, we have to use the machine learning algorithm. This is, uh, I think it's logistic regression that's over there. Um, so basically, we allow the um, uh, features, genomic features, into the machine learning algorithm so that uh, one pipeline may be better at calling um, variants with specific features. And in that case, a call by that pipeline will, given, will be given a, a larger weight. So it's because it's 
higher chance that it will be accurate. Uh, so by using different weight uh, against the genomic features, we managed to get a method that is 60% sensitivity and 90% precision. Um, it's, it's tough. Indels is it's just tougher to call than SNBs. Um, so you may ask, okay, well, why do you want to use uh, three algorithms when you could maybe only one? Um, run one or maybe just run two, then this is when we want to look at the accuracy uh, and, and the cost. So um, on the x-axis is the cost per donor. Uh, this is based on um, our estimate using AWS spot instances. Uh, so running one alignment algorithm and then uh, any combination of either one variant calling pipeline and the y-axis shows you the accuracy. So what you want is to have high accuracy, but at lower cost, you know, you want to, you don't even want to be here, up there. I don't think it's working anymore. Uh, so you want to be on the top left corner, uh, but that, that's hard to achieve. Uh, but as you can see, if we run just the DKFZ and Sanger alone, um, cost is low, but we don't achieve such high accuracy as we want. Uh, if you run just the Broad pipeline alone, it's actually just as costly as running uh, two, uh, two pipelines. So the best case scenario for us in terms of accuracy is using all three pipelines. But it comes at the cost of about $100. Um, but keep in mind, for Peacock, we, we were just you know, out the door. We just had to get it done very quickly. So we did not spend a lot of time optimizing. Um, so if you have the time to optimize, if you know that you're going to scale up to tens of thousands of samples, do spend your time to um, uh, benchmark and optimize. And just to give you a very simple example, when we started off with alignment, we used 30, a 32-core machine on AWS. It took two days to finish and cost $30. But then we realize that um, the alignment, the BWA alignment, yes, use all of our cores, but then the Picard process use only about 4% of the CPU. So we're wasting a lot of CPU. And we didn't do a lot of fancy, fancy things. We did a simple switch. We went to a smaller machine with only four cores. So of course it took five days to run, but it only cost $6. So something simple uh, could actually save you a bit of money and is worth doing. And it's, you have to weigh in how much time, how much effort uh, you want to put into to, uh, your optimization. Okay. Yes. Yes, yeah, so for uh, structural variations, I didn't talk about it as much here. Um, there was a, um, so the, the, yes, using the validation, SV was all, the SV group also decided that it will be two, uh, any calls made by two out of three, two or more of the three algorithms will be used. But the strategy is like slightly different because they ha had to look for consensus breakpoints. So that's what that SV group did. They actually had to uh, look for any consensus breakpoints. Um, those consensus breakpoints are decided by any two algorithms out of three uh, to be called. Yeah. OK, so after all this work that we have done, um, the alignments and variant calling pipelines, uh, the data is usable, searchable. You can find it at the ICGC portal. But the workflows, that's our uh, blood and sweat. And um, we have dockerized all of these workflows. And this is now put on Doc Store. So you can actually go to this site. You will find uh, all of our pipelines there. Not all of the broad pipelines are there yet, but we're working on it. But otherwise, Alignment, um, Sanger, DKFZ, uh, those pipelines are all there. And, and you can use it for your own data. Um, so out of this um, technical part, we will have two, we're working on two manuscripts, uh, one describing the software infrastructure, uh, the workflow operations, a preprint is already in bioarchive, and then if you're interested in the algorithms uh, to, to generate the, these variants, uh, a paper is in the work, it's, it's um, not in bioarchive yet, this is the, um, the lead author is Jonathan Dursey, uh, but soon this will go, go into bioarchive. Um, 
In fact, a lot of the data is already, uh, sorry, a lot of the papers are already published in BioArchive, uh, specifically if you're interested in the science, uh, scientific outcomes. So uh, we're completing our manuscripts. Uh, there are, um, I believe, uh, Papers already in on germline mutation signatures, driver events. Um, so far, that we expect about five, 50, minute, 50 manuscripts coming out. Um, hopefully, late 2018, uh, they will come out. Uh, so, just to give you some highlight uh, of, of, the, of the results, uh, we found that 50% of the donors have at least one non-coding driver mutation. I mean, non-coding non regions were not looked at in exome, so this data is very valuable, allowing us to see the uh, non-coding events. And um, this, is, this is very important to know because um, looking at driver genes is great, but these non-coding regions, especially regulatory regions, are important as well in cancer. Um, and also we found that on average, uh, each sample has 4.6 driver events. When we call it a driver events, it can be um, SNV in the genomic region or non-coding regions, or it could be structural variant as well. So I think a lot of them are in the promoters, but I will have to go back to, to look at the paper. But yeah, those are very interesting ones. And then we also found that uh, we don't find any new, uh, many new driver genes. Basically, these are known driver genes already. However, uh, the event occurring to these driver genes are, are very diverse because some of them are promoter regions that are affected. Sometimes uh, are the UTR environment uh, regions. So this is this gives us a better view of what is um, what along that gene is being affected uh, in in these already known cancer driver genes. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, so there is a large analysis in the paper that, that you have to go through. Uh, but in general, is basically looking for a statistically significant event uh, against a background. So the background could be from um, actually a, a set of normals from other projects as well. So one other thing that we're very interested in is, in, is the uh, structural variations. And this doesn't show up very well in the screen because the room is very bright. But basically, um, the, two, the two sides here are the chromosome numbers. Some of it actually was covered here. Um, and then for every time there is an intra-chromosomal uh, structural variant, this is sort of marked in between chromosome 1 and chromosome 1, or there's interchromosomal uh, variations. So it's hard to see here, but you have to you have to believe me when I say that between chromosome twelve um, has chromosome twelve has a lot of intrachromosome no it's from I can't see what, what number is that. But there is a lot of interchromosomal events uh, with chromosome twelve and another chromosome there. Ah, okay, so there, that helps me actually. Let me go back. So, okay, these are the regions with the break points between two chromosomes. And yes, yeah, so there's some hot spots actually. Okay. Um, so, also, we looked at viruses, I, I mentioned before, but there wasn't a lot of new, we, we didn't find any new virus, actually. These are all known already uh, in, you know, HPV-16, in cervix and head and neck uh, cancer, um, liver, you have HPV, but you do see that, hey, th this is reconfirming what we know already. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't see any new virus coming out of, out of this project. Uh, I'll skip this one, but... This, is, this I found very interesting. So um, this method was developed by, um, by someone at OICR, where they tried to use 
the SNVs uh, and the mutations to predict the origin of that tumor. Um, so along here, this is the predicted tumor type, and this is the, act, the real, the actual tumor type. So overall, um, they have pretty good accuracy. Um, if you the, basically the the red the the more red the better the higher the accuracy, and so this is along as a how well do they predict. Um, so it does depend on the cancer type and also the number of samples. Uh, why this why is this interesting? Because if we can get um, biops liquid biopsy, so if you just take circulating tumor DNA, uh, and based on the mutations you see and can predict where that tumor DNA comes from, you can potentially diagnose the origin of that cancer. So this is, yes? Yes, exactly. And, but there's also some papers coming out now that use, for example, DNA methylation to put on an extra layer of this. Yes. And the paper about Cancer locator. Yeah. That's also circulating for free DNA and circulating tumor DNA. And they were also quite accurate in predicting the tissue of origin. So I guess if you could combine mutations and methylation, you would be even more accurate. Yeah, because you see, you see methylation being a very good classifier for, for tumor subtypes. Uh, so, yeah, it would be really nice to, to get this kind of diagnosis. I mean, imagine if you just can get a blood test and uh, just easily predict, uh, get a diagnosis, like possibly we should look into another area for potential cancer. So, yeah. Yeah, so that's also what a lot of clinicians think. They, they do not like, at least in Denmark, they do not like to hand cancer tests because they tell their patients you have cancer and they give them a scan and they can't see anything. Like, you have cancer, but we don't know where it is and we can't find it. Right, yeah. So we don't know where to look. So hopefully this, this will become, you know, a, a clinic, actual clinical usage uh, in the near future. Really yeah. Okay. Um, so just want to wrap up uh, the pan pan uh, peacock part uh, with some lessons that we learned. So as I said before, uh, we, we had multiple compute centers uh, for data storage and data, uh, and data computing. And so what I've highlighted is actually their environment here is, are different. So the blue ones are the HPC environments, uh, the yellow ones are academic clouds, and the pink ones are commercial clouds. So uh, it was helpful to have Dockers to allow us to run uh, algorithms in different environments, but uh, they are all slightly different to manage. So uh, when we did this, this was we didn't have a lot of tools at the time. So what happened is in each environment, each environment, it could be a cloud, it could be HPC. There are always uh, what we call a cloud shepherd. This is a person supervising uh, the, the execution of the workflows, uh, reporting back, you know, to project manager and say, okay, we have a problem with this, maybe a system outage or some problems with samples. Um, so at least a good thing is we do have a real-time job tracker. So the way we managed to do this is because we have a centralized metadata. So um, GNOS allows us to track a lot of the metadata and we pull from all the, uh, uh, the GNOS servers um, on a nightly basis. So we know, okay, which sample has finished which pipeline. Uh, so we could actually uh, report back, so that's why you see uh, your progress over time, uh, what samples have already been finished, uh, what has not. And also then the person, the project manager, that was me at the time, uh, can delegate out and say, okay, you know, EBI, could you please run this pipeline on this set of samples? It was a, we sort of delegate out these um, uh, jobs on a weekly basis. We do it this way because it has to be dynamic. Uh, maybe a site can go down because uh, out, schedule outage, unscheduled outage, so we need to dynamically allocate and reshuffle the work as we need to. So there was a lot of um, manual interference in, in this process. Um, and um, we can definitely do better uh, as we go. And 
also want to mention the uh, comparison of the different compute environments. I mean, we, we're talking about using cloud a lot, but I don't think HPC clusters will completely be gone. Um, and there's some advantage with using HPC because the cloud shepherds themselves at the center already know the system. They know the storage system. They know how to queue up their jobs. It was very fast for them to just go, get going and running. Um, but the problem, though, is usually the hardware is slightly older, and um, they cannot give us these very large machines to run jobs. So, you know, the Bro pipeline took 32 cores and 256 gig RAM. Not many uh, institutes have those kind of machines, and also this is a shared resource with their own compute, uh, their researchers. So they cannot really monopolize the system and just run it uh, over a long period of time. Uh, we do have academic clouds in this environment as well. Um, when we used it, it was new new clouds for many institutes. So we had to kick the tires. There were a lot of issues. Uh, but I think overall, it, it worked out for everybody. They had feedback to improve the system. We got some free compute, uh, but it's still limited because they were ramping up, building out. Uh, commercial clouds. AWS and Azure was great because we could use a lot of VMs at any one time, and um, it, it was really helpful to have that burst. But at the time, which is still true actually, um, some of the jurisdictions don't allow their data to go onto commercial clouds. Um, this was specifically true with the German data set. Um, they did not let, uh, want their data to go into commercial clouds because of the privacy issues that are specific to that country. Um, so what we want to do, um, uh, you know, knowing the, the amount of data um, that you get in this project is to make sure you co-locate your data and your compute. Uh, whether it's commercial or academic, um, it doesn't matter. You don't want to have spend time downloading your data, and especially if you download from the cloud. There's an egress cost that is about you know, 50, 55000 um, for one petabyte if you try to move it out of Amazon. Um, you don't want to move that. And then, as I said, metadata is really key for tracking your both your raw data, your analyzed data, and also your, the progress of your workflow. Uh, so standardize the metadata from the beginning, but it's hard to predict everything that you need. So you've got to be very flexible, add your metadata along the way, uh, use JSON, you know, that's, that's a flexible way to represent your metadata. Uh, we use Elasticsearch to index the data. So think of it as a very fast database for a lot of the metadata so you can easily query and get it out. Um, and also, when you try to run your jobs, use your BAM stats to help you predict your, your, um, uh, your job. How much, how much resource do you need? Like, so the number one guideline is coverage. Um, if you have a very high coverage sample, you need a, a, a larger machine. I think George showed you just divide your sample meet to you know two groups. You know one that is um, small and large, so that you know what type of machine to use. Um, high granularity would be good. We also know how to predict long running jobs. Um, so we found that samples that have large percentage of discordant reads um, usually go to take a long time to run. So when I say discordant reads, meaning that your um, pair ends are, the, the, your two pair, the two reads in the pair are mapped to different chromosomes. So in that case, those are usually long running jobs. So you don't want to run them in, academic, uh, sorry, in commercial clouds where you have to pay. So save it on an academic cloud or HPC where you don't have to pay. Um, so as I said before, we need to minimize the human intervention with some smarter logics uh, if we were to do this in the long run. Um, so any failed jobs need to uh, be restarted automatically. That may mean going to larger VMs automatically instead of having someone requeuing them. Uh, we need better monitoring system. You don't want your VMs to be sitting idle and you don't know about that for a couple of days. That costs you money and doing, doing nothing. Um, Execution services need to take into uh, account real-time conditions. So what do I mean by real-time conditions? Um, we have replicated the data to multiple data centers. So you want to know which data center is available at, at runtime and which one is closest to you, give you the best uh, um, cost-effective way to transfer the data to, your, to the VM that you're running. 
Um, so if one resource is out, try the next resource. So this you want to know, uh, can easily you need to be dynamic on where you download your data. And then if you have multiple compute environments, then you may want to know, well, at this time I'm about to run, which one is cheaper? Um, so you know Amazon have spot instances, uh, Google Cloud also have preemptible VMs. Um, you, you want to know the market price and then make a decision on where to run your jobs uh, instead of just sticking with one, um, uh, one environment. Um, also, during our project, we got free donation from, from uh, projects. They said, we have compute credits on Azure, it's free feel free to use it. And so you want to be able to switch from environment to take advantage uh, of these offers. Um, so like I said, save the long running jobs for academic clouds. Uh, and then that will be some of the things that we need to consider. Um, so we need to improve our cloud orchestration uh, for uh, if we were to use this kind of strategy long term. So instead of having people uh, in the, from a previous picture, we should have something like a multi-cloud orchestrator. So it can consider the real-time conditions and then assign the job to different cloud environments to take advantage of uh, uh, cost efficiency uh, and bandwidth. And then at each, each cloud environment, we should have a workflow management engine that automatically retry jobs uh, to get us onto larger VMs if necessary. So try to minimize the amount of work that a, a cloud shepherd has to do. Um, so why do we want to do this? Um, because there are several new projects that are very similar to Peacock. Uh, one of them is the Pan Prostate Initiative. This is ongoing. They have, uh, it doesn't sound like a lot of samples relative to, uh, to Peacock, but they do have a thousand whole genomes, uh, 500 exomes, and a lot more data types. So managing the data types uh, will be, will be ch is challenging for them. And this is also across uh, multiple jurisdictions. So the, those are very similar scenario as in Peacock. But the one most important uh, project that is about to be launched uh, this spring, yes? So these other initiatives, are they going to try and copy into the workflow so that they can add them when they're done, or are they just starting so some of so I know Penn Prostate has already adopted the Sanger pipeline. Uh, so they I think what they do is they use a lot of our pipelines, but further improve it, um, and both in terms of performance and accuracy. Uh, so the, the one large initiative is the RC, ICGC Argo. It stands for Accelerating Research in Genomic Oncology. This will be launched in the spring under ICGC. Uh, it's intended to be a 10-year project to collect and characterize uh, over 200,000 uh, donors, mostly participating in clinical trials. So this is not just getting sequencing done, but they want to have uh, drug responses during clinical trials from those pa these patients, and a lot more clinical data will be uh, collected. Um, so this is much larger than, than Peacock, it's almost 100 times larger, and it will be done over eight to 10 years time. So previously in Peacock, we, when we did it in over two to three years time, now this needs to be sustainable. You, you don't want to have cloud shepherds, you know, spending a lot of time monitoring jobs. Uh, you, you need to be, have an automated system to really run th these numbers. Um, so this is sort of the proposal, uh, um, Argo is going to use where they will have um, sequencing data submitted to different data centers, probably by region, just like Peacock. And then they would also have um, a team to deal with um, uh, here. So deal with pipeline engineering. So you know, once a ma method is good, uh, depend based on the benchmark of the group, they said, hey, a variant calling pipeline is really good. This is the one we should use. Then this engineering group will package it to Docker, make sure that it can be run in the cloud environment, and we can run it anywhere, basically, that, that we can have resources. And then once the data is analyzed, it can be uh, go through uh, the DCC, where they curate the data, they will further collect the clinical data from the different groups, and then all this data will be made available through the ICGC data portal. Um, so the idea is that the data centers will be very, um, these data centers will be spread out across regions, but they will be given workflows by the, the engineering group so that they run the, on the local data. 
So this is going to be the model uh, that ICGC Argo will use. Are, are they going to or Yes, yes. Yeah. So we want to make sure uniform analysis across. Yeah. Okay. So we've gone through an hour, and I don't know if the people need a break. Yeah. Yeah, I messed it up to see if people dozing off. <laughs> So we didn't talk about uh, some of the two major cancer data sets that are available for research use. Um, so as I said before, ICGC, we have 17,000 donors. You can access raw data if you wish, um, but otherwise somatic mutations are openly available and clinical data is also available. So you can do a lot already without uh, having to apply for a DACO. And then the NCI Genomic Data Commons, currently there are 32,000 donors in there. Um, and I'll go over what data set is available. Uh, so for ICGC data, you will, um, you can get access to the whole genomes, and there are about 6,500 donors with the whole genomes, uh, 28 of which are actually part of PCOG, so they are uniformly analyzed already if that's, that's what you want to have. 7,500 donors with whole exomes, uh, and then some of them have already seek microRNA by self seq and array-based uh, calls as well. So it's, it's a very good mix uh, if you want to uh, access it is at the portal. Um, so um, for controlled access, yes, you, you have to apply for uh, through the data access control office, but once approved, you get access to all ICGC data. Um, so this is the ICGC portal, uh, just a screenshot of it. Um, you, you get uh, quite, uh, you see that, that this is the latest release from um, December and uh, you see these are the cancer projects, so the, those are, you can see that t all together there are over 10,000 unique uh, um, donors with uh, S SNVs already, uh, somatic, simple somatic mutations already um, annotate, uh, analyzed. Uh, this is the, I guess this was called the hamburger plot before, um, and showing the mutation rate. So these are the different projects. And this is the number of mutations per megabase. So um, as usual, melanoma has the highest mutation rate. So this gives you a little bit of um, uh, overview. But the good thing is on the left side is a faceted search. So just like how you go to go do your shopping on Amazon, you can choose the cancer types that you're interested in, the data types you're interested in. Um, so faceted search, you would see that there are donor tab, gene tab, mutations tab. Meaning for each um, tab, you can select donors with specific characteristics uh, or genes that you're specifically interested in and even mutations uh, that you, if that's what you, you care about. Um, so this is how you can uh, do your search and then you'll see the donors that meet your search and then uh, which project they're coming from. There's some, uh, the disease site, uh, simple clinical data, and then the great thing is you see what available data types there are, and even quick summaries of the number of mutations and number of genes. Okay. So um, the ICGC portal is not just for querying um, um, and downloading data. It allows you to do some simple exploration of the data itself without uh, having to download it. So this is uh, possible to look in a genome browser, the mutation regions that you're specifically interested in. Um, so this allows you to zoom in and out. This saves you the trouble to download the data. And also notice that um, there are pathway information. So this is actually the query that, uh, that was selected. It was uh, the disease site was brain with a consequence type of frame shift variant and then uh, related to a pathway. This is a code of the pathway. 
uh, but there you can actually search for those pathways that are you interested in. And once you're happy with your search, now you can look, you open the genome browser right on the portal to look at the data without downloading. Um, this is another very cool feature um, because you can actually stream a BAM file. Um, you, because when you don't have full access to the BAM raw data, you cannot download it. But you can still get some summary information of a uh, BAM that you can actually stream right on. So you can see the coverage uh, of that file, um, some reach distribution in the region, and you can actually click a chromosome or zoom into the chromosome. Uh, this is all live streaming, so this is pretty cool. Um, also, there's streaming of, of VCF. Um, I know VCF is always tough to, to read uh, for a human when there's so much information in there. So there is at least some summary from uh, the VCF about you know, uh, where along the chromosome uh, have variants. Uh, there's some base changes, summary. So this is another uh, nice way that you're summarizing a lot of data because these are 24,000 variants uh, actually summarized here. Um, so on the ICGC portal, there are other information uh, for annotating your mutation. Um, this is uh, slightly blocked, but this is a lollipop, lollipop plot uh, looking at along the gene where the mutation is and also the frequency of the mutation. So this is the number of donors on the y-axis. So you can see maybe some hot spots uh, based on uh, a cohort. And the nice thing is also uh, there's now additional annotation on compounds. So drug, uh, drug entities can now be annotated. So you can start linking your um, mutation data to compounds if the data is available. So it's also depending on the community uh, starting to have more of the drug compounds uh, annotated in the database. Uh, you can also visualize pathways uh, in, in the, this is the reactome pathway, so uh, information is already uh, pulled from the reactome database and your mutations that you're interested in can be overlay onto the pathway to give you a sense of uh, how your mutations fit into a specific pathway. Um, this is the OncoGrid, if you have seen it in the CBio portal before, sort of showing you um, each column is a, a donor, uh, each row is a gene, how what genes are mutated are in this cohort are sort of uh, grouped in a visual way so that you can actually see uh, exclusivity. So when donors with this TP53 mutation, they typically, typically, do not have the other mutation, which I can't see here. Um, but they will have this you know, uh, second gene being mutated for most of the time. So these are all nice features to have. And one thing to mention is a lot of the visualization tools on the uh, ICGC portal is actually open source, it is available as uh, in, in a tool suite called OncoJS, is a JavaScript uh, suite. And so you can uh, download that, set up in, in your own portal if you wish, so that you can see the pathways, you have the OncoGrid, you got the lollipop plot, survival plot, uh, and other tools. So if that's something you're interested, definitely take a look at this open source. Uh, another interesting thing that you can do with the ICGC portal is uh, synthetic cohorts. So based on your search uh, criteria, you can uh, create cohort A and, or cohort B and then compare them, uh, look at their survival analysis between two cohorts. Um, and so this is a, a nice way to enable some analysis without downloading the data. Um, so as I said, G the DCC release has um, been going on for the last uh, eight, eight, nine years, and all the data is archived. So if you read a publication and specifically refer to ICGC data release 19, you can always come back here. This is basically a snapshot of the releases. And as you can see, there are usually uh, releases every, I believe it's three or four releases per year. So um, you would get, you won't have to worry about the data is changing every day, but you would get easily uh, look up a release that is referred to uh, in a publication. Um, so one thing I have to say though, so the ICGC portal basically hosts all the uh, clinical data and the mutations. So those are small data sets. 
the raw data itself is not hosted at ICGC portal because that's too much. Uh, so it's kind of distributed. Um, so some of the data is in the EGA uh, archive. This is the raw, the raw reads that we're talking about. Uh, we also have the raw reads in Peacock servers that are host, uh, engine, the engine back engines Genos, but we're actually uh, gradually retiring those. As I said before, the NCI data, the TCGA data, is actually in uh, the genomic data commons because they cannot leave uh, US. Uh, Cancer Collaboratory holds some of the data, so does Amazon. So the raw data is distributed to many places. Uh, you can still use the portal to find the data. So this is what you can do. Come to the browser, you can choose maybe there's a specific uh, data sort, data repository you're interested in, or maybe data type, or you can look at donors, maybe there are disease types that you're interested in. But basically, once you uh, choose your uh, criteria, you have a set of files you're interested in downloading. It tells you which repository uh, holds these files. And what you can do is actually save the donor set. You can save, uh, save it as a manifest. Um, and then now you can use a tool to download these files. So what happened is um, I show you before a file actually has multiple copies in different repositories. You actually have a choice where you want to download from. So at the beginning, it's, it shows you a lot of files, like everything. But once you click Remove Duplicate Files, it only um, shows you the repositories. And you can prioritize them. You can say, I prefer to download from AWS Virginia. And so most of your files are coming from here. The remaining files that you don't get will be in your next second repository. So this is a really cool way to uh, help you download unique files that you want and uh, based on uh, prior, um, repositories that are maybe closer to you geographically or maybe because of cost issues. So this is a nice tool. Uh, so once you have this, this can be, um, once you have this set up, you can generate a manifest. So a manifest is just uh, a list of files and the location uh, that you want to download from. Um, but because the files are in multiple sources and each data source has a different download client, it gets very uh, confusing. So for example, GNOS requires a tool called GT Download. You have to go and install it, set it up, complicated. GDC has its own tool called the Data Transfer Tool. Um, AWS and Collaboratory, we, you can use the ICGC uh, storage client, or you can use uh, just the AWS uh, client as well. EGA has its own tool um, that is uh, it's tough to install, and it's a little, um, but it's again, it's, it's another tool. Uh, the PDC that uses an AWS client. So to simplify all this, you don't have to remember any of this, um, the ICGC um, uh, DCC came up with a tool, a one, one tool called ICGC Git. So it's a very simple concept that they have packaged all these download clients into one Docker. And so now you just have to invoke one command called ICGC Get, and it will be smart enough to know which download client to use depending on your, your data uh, repository. So we did that, I showed you already, you already did your search your data, you get a manifest, and now all you need, you don't even have to download the manifest itself. You just need a manifest ID because the actual manifest is stored on the ICGC server. You just have to ID point to it, and then you can do ICGC get, download, and then my manifest ID, and this will all done in the background for me. They could be coming from multiple locations, but I don't have to worry about it. So this is a pretty smart way that, um, uh, that the ICGC came, team came up with. Oh, so I already said this already. Um, so the next bit is about the um, uh, uh, genomic data commons. So who, who knows about GDC already? Okay. Uh, do people know about CG Hub? Okay. So basically, um, the can and the NCI uh, came had the TCGA data. This is the the genome can uh, TCGA, the genome atlas 
the cancer genome atlas. Um, so this was started. This started over ten years ago with um, multiple cancer types being sequenced, mostly exomes with RNA seq. Uh, sorry, at the time it was mainly expression arrays, um, and all the data was pulled in originally just on an SFTP site. Uh, this was um, what they call the Jamboree site. But then over time, the raw data has gone to CG Hub. Um, but CG Hub was retired uh, a couple of years ago, and now basically is all hosted in the NCI Data Commons. And the idea is that uh, we will have a portal for you to search, um, also point you, allow you to download, and also do some visualization and uh, some analysis as well. So this is all sounding very similar to the ICGC portal. And as you look at the two, they're pretty much cousins because the front end is de developed by the same team uh, at OICR. Um, but um, GDC being a government pr funded project is very structured, very organized. Uh, so besides the data portal, there is a, a website with a lot of documentation. So these two websites are tell you everything you need to know. So if you want to know about the pipelines, the data types, everything in there, uh, they're very well documented. Uh, GTC also has a submission portal. Um, so projects, new projects that want to submit data to the GDC can go through a, a process. They can request to submit the data. And then if approved, they get to use a tool to submit the data to GDC. And again, during the submission process, data is validated. Uh, there's controlled meta, control metadata, clinical data that, you, that users have to uh, follow. And I said there, there was a data transfer too that allows you to do multi-part downloads, meaning that if your uh, download is stalled or, or aborted, you can easily restart and pick up where you left off. Uh, and then there's an application programming interface. So for people who don't want to use the portal to interact um, with the data, they can actually use an API so to make it easy as part of their, their code to get at the data. Um, so one very uh, interesting about the GDC, though, it may not be obvious, is that uh, the GDC is tasked with realigning all the data. Again, doing uniform analysis, but this time to the latest genome build, so GRCH838. Um, so if you were, uh, so in PCA, I didn't point out, uh, but the analysis was done against HG19. Um, and I think we're in a transition time where a lot of people are still sticking with HG19. It's very difficult to get them to switch, but I think we need to gradually get there. So GDC is taking the lead in reharmonizing all the TCGA data, uh, to, and anything that goes into GDC has, will be uh, uniformly analyzed to GRCH38. Uh, so because we cannot get rid of HG19 data yet. Um, so the older data is still, uh, we put it in the legacy archive. So there's the older TCGA data, target data, so target stand for therapeutically ap applicable research to generate effective treatments. That's basically pediatric data. Um, and then there's the CCLE stands for the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia. So that's older data that was previously in CG Hub and they're now migrated to uh, HG19 as they were, so they were not reanalyzed. Um, they could be called by different algorithms depending on the working group's uh, choice at the time. So we still have to make that available because people want it. But in the active portal, that's where we have the reharmonized uh, data. So there are over 32,000 donors across 40 projects. The TCGA data comprises uh, 11,000 donors and 33 projects. Target has 3,000 donors. Uh, as typically, pediatric data is smaller data set, so it only has 3,000 donors. And the latest and fairly interesting is the foundation medicine data. So TCGA and Target were mostly exomes. Uh, we haven't made the whole genomes available yet. yet. They will be. Foundation medicine is targeted sequencing. So 18,000 cases sounds like a lot, uh, but it's all targeted sequencing. So in terms of data size, it's actually not much. Um, and also because foundation medicine gave us the data, just gave us only the variants. We do not have the raw data, so we didn't have to go through the whole real, realigning. We basically lifted those calls to uh, GRCH38. 
Yes. That's not, they don't teach you anything germline. Okay? No. What so, is, how do you integrate that back with everything else? Yeah, so there hasn't been, are you talking about specifically for foundation medicine? or? Yeah, they don't give us the germline, and I don't think they will have it because it's all targeted panel. Yeah. No, they, it's based on their own pipeline. Yeah, so this is something we try to make clear to people uh, in the documentation. Those, we just don't have a choice, um, but it's too, too precious a data set to give up uh, just because they don't have the same pipeline. Yes. Uh, is there something on uh, DDC right now that doesn't exist on ICDC? Because there was integration of TCPA data on ICDC, right? Yeah, so definitely. I mean, target data is not in ICGC. Foundation medicine is not. And also, um, the TCG, they did some kind of vetting process on how choosing some samples to submit to ICGC. I don't know what their criteria is, but definitely there are samples in GDC, but not in ICGC. Okay, so GDC data, um, keep in mind, it's slightly different from ICGC. So all the metadata, clinical data, that's open access, no problem. Only the TCJ somatic mutations are open, uh, and they have some germline masking already done. So target data is completely controlled, uh, because typically um, pediatric community would like to protect their donors uh, a bit more. Uh, FMI also, uh, Foundation Medicine, that's also controlled. Uh, so if you need to apply for dbGaP access, this is sort of the link, but keep in mind that this is not like ICGC, so you have to apply to specific studies uh, to get access, and you basically provide a research statement saying what you do with the data. Uh, if along the way you're, you want to expand your research, so you now want to do more than you originally said you would do, then you can submit an amendment. Um, I know sometimes TCJ get, uh, DB get, sorry, DB gap gets a bad rap about, oh, it's so complicated, it takes so long, but that's not true, actually. Um, usually, the application is stuck at people's own institute because your institute has to sign off on that application. Uh, your IT director has to sign off. That's actually the bottleneck. So once DB gap receives your application, it, they turn it around within a couple of days. Um, so the GDC portal, um, this is, I'll try to do a bit of a demo instead of showing you screenshots. I need to get that reduced. All right, so this is the portal, uh, GDC portal, and um, it has, again, the, these or, organoids, um, you actually, as part of the OncoJS visualization suite, if, you, if you're interested. Um, so we have 40 projects there, and you can go to the project page to explore. Um, so just like the ICGC portal, you can see, uh, choose your primary site, you see the, prod, the TCGA target and foundation medicine data set, uh, you can see the number of cases that are affected based on uh, a particular gene. So this is TP53, you know, the, the most mutated gene across all the projects. Uh, and you get to see um, the distribution of cases across the projects. So say if I choose um, kidney disease, um, actually I'll show the exploration page first. So this is the cool page because it allows you to do some, uh, start to have some visualization done. So you can choose a kidney, uh, say with genes mutated. So let's pick the rat, TP53. So that's another nice thing that when you type, this can actually automatically fill in for you uh, some suggested um, uh, terms. So this is all the cases, only 36 cases, not that much, uh, the, with uh, primary site as kidney and the gene TP53 mutated. So if I click on Oncogrid, actually let me take out TP53. So 
12. So if I took out a TP53 and just look at kidney cancer, and now I can easily get an oncogrid showing me the most mutated gene, the most frequently mutated genes, BHL. Uh, as I said, because each column is a patient, here you can actually see the number of mutations in that patient. So you've got one who has 45 uh, mutations rather than you know, these lower ones. And if you're interested in looking at these cases, you can. So at the bottom, there's very simple um, annotation based on clinical data. But let's say if we look at uh, one of the mutations, so I can click on any one of them. This is a missense variant. And now coming here, I want to look at the mutation itself. So this is your lollipop plot, right? So this is the gene VHL, and it shows me where they're mutated, and the color code tells me whether it is a missense, so red is missense, the blue is uh, stop gamed, and these are considered high impact mutations. And then by looking at the frequency, well, there's no specific one that uh, stand out, but at least uh, you can see all where, where the uh, regions are. And here's the PFAM domain, if um, that's what you're interested in. Okay. Um, so what's also what's very interesting is you can now do analysis. So you can actually create sets. So what I said before, you can create synthetic or cohorts. This is what you can do. So um, this is a demo set. So all I'm choosing, I could create three sets. One is has from bladder cancer with high impact mutations detected by the algorithm Mutech2. So this is one of the variant calling pipeline. And I want to look at a second set. This is a different, second, uh, different calling pipeline far scan and a third pipeline of MUSE. And basically, I just have this set operations just to find out, well, how well do these three pipelines overlap? And you see that um, some of the, there are a good overlap here at the center called by three pipelines. And in a sense, you can choose, because right now we don't have the consensus calls here yet. So if you want to uh, know, maybe you need to very accurate uh, mutations for your research purpose, then this is the region that you want to use and those are the mutations that you want to look at. So now you can actually click on um, this set and bring up the mutations. Maybe that's too many to bring up. Uh, but what you can also do is save it to your, um, to your list. Okay. So this is going back to the exploration, back to the exploration for me to look at, but okay. Yeah, so these are all the uh, 6,006 6, mutations that I can list, look at. I can easily look at any of the cases specifically if I want to know uh, any clinical attributes out of it. Um, so another cool thing, though, you notice that, okay, for these cases, uh, I have a survival plot. And I can actually select a specific mutation to see if patients having that mutation, do they have a slightly different uh, survival uh, pr property. So slightly. So the green, the, the orange one here are the cases with this particular mutation, the blue ones are the ones that do not have the mutations, and you see the lock rent, lock rent uh, p value. So, this allows you to really nicely an analyze the data without, um, uh, without much um, downloading or having to manipulate the data. So, this is nice. Uh, yes, sure. How do the Mm -hmm. What type of input data would you need in order to do it? If you had everything installed from the adoption and everything on the hybrid, what kind of input data would you need in order to do that? Right. So right now the back end of this is all in Elasticsearch. Um, but that's one question I had to the OncoJS team as well, is like people need to manipulate data into a certain form. So they do give you instructions on how to do that. Uh, I believe it was just flat file to start with. But I, I'll have to double check on that. Yeah. Um, so, okay, and okay, this is in the cohort comparison as well because if you're you have two, this is a nice example. Um, 
this is basically pancreatic cancer where KRAS is predominantly mutated. Uh, but you also have patients who don't have uh, KRAS mutated. So you create that cohort, and then you can look at the difference in their survival. Uh, that is quite that is actually significant. And then you can also look at, well, how is that segregated between gen and gender, uh, maybe their vital status, um, when their diagnosis, so you see the distribution and when, when uh, patients were diagnosed, not diagnosed uh, based on whether they have or do not have the KRAS mutation, and you can sort of choose. Um, so GDC is in the process of adding a lot of more clinical data in there. So this will gradually build and hopefully be even more useful for people to um, uh, do analysis right on the, the portal. Um, and the repository page is very similar to what you've seen in uh, ICGC. You can choose and pick your, your donors. Eventually, you can put it in your cart, whether you download it or make it into a manifest. Uh, so a lot of options. Okay. So do play around with this uh, when you have a chance, because there are a lot of uh, cool properties here. I can skip through a few of the slides now that I've done a live demo. Uh, let's see. Okay. So yeah, so the data transfer too, as I mentioned before, this is something you can use for multi-part downloads. Uh, it's much easier when you have a lot of files or um, large files. Ah, okay, so I do want to talk about the API. So programmatically, uh, you can get at do queries. Uh, using an API. So this is when I say API, so this is the uh, API URL. This is sort of an endpoint saying that I'm interested in uh, searching projects because if you can imagine this is actually going on your left side facet. I pick pro under projects, specific uh, project ID or primary site. Uh, this is kind of like checking off the, those facets of search and then this is how I can do query. Um, and then this is actually what I've demoed. Um, okay. Yeah, so these are the uh, features that you've already seen survival plot, uh, protein mutated coding re regions, and Uncle Grid. Uh, this is the set analysis I just showed you. Uh, okay, so I think I can skip these. So um, I do want to talk about resources that you, you can find for any cloud-based analysis. So what I've shown you is, OK, now you can find the data sets uh, in either ICGC or TCGA. You may want to just look at mutations, look at survival plots. You're happy with that. But there would be a different type of researchers who want to actually analyze the data a little deeper, maybe looking at a BAM looking at VCFs, uh, they want to do additional analysis. Maybe they have their own algorithms they want to test out on the data. So there are a couple options. Uh, you have commercial clouds out there already, uh, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft Azure. And then there are NCI cloud resources. I'll dive into these uh, in a little bit. But uh, the NCI cloud resources are also on commercial clouds. Uh, Seven Bridges is on AWS. Uh, the ISB system and the Broadfire Cloud are on Google. And the good thing about them is because the TCG, uh, the GDC data is already on those two clouds. So the NCI cloud resources becomes a platform, uh, a workspace, where they provide you with tools, analysis tools that are already containerized. And they also give you um, um, a space to share your results with your collaborators. Uh, so that, that's very customized for cancer research. And then you also have academic clouds. So University of Chicago has the Bionimbus Protected Data Cloud, um, and then on OICR has the Cancer Genome Collaboratory. Commercial clouds are good because uh, you can easily set up, uh, start up there, uh, and they come up with um, native services. So if you want to just not use anything fancy. Um, for example, the AWS batch will allow you to submit a, a, to run a large amount of jobs. They have container registry that is equivalent to, say, Docstore. 
uh, container services, database uh, service already there. They already have Elasticsearch. So they do have a lot of services. And actually, sometimes it's a little overwhelming to, to get through the catalog and find the things that you need. But uh, the, the community you talk to will have recommendations for you. Uh, Google Cloud Platform comes with several uh, great things. Kubernetes, that's really already open source for you to um, deploy your containers. BigQuery table, people find is very useful. I mean, you, you can think of it as a, just a big table, but they have very good performance. Uh, so um, there's even talk about putting variants into the BigQuery table to do very fast searches. Now, DSUP uh, in Google Cloud, I think, is, is very interesting because if you're familiar with um, the HPC cluster, so SignGrid Engine, you're really familiar with QSUP commands. Um, so they have the DSUP command that is pretty much give you the exact syntax, the rest of the syntax, the options, exactly like QSUP. So that becomes much easier for people who are accustomed to HPC. Uh, this removes a bit of barrier because uh, cloud seems to uh, overwhelm some researchers because they have to put all their tools, to, uh, rewrite their tools to get it onto cloud. So DSO makes it easier uh, to do the transition. Uh, Microsoft Azure, um, I, I don't have a lot to say about it just because I haven't played with it a lot. So the NCI Cloud Resources uh, actually was launched as pilots uh, back in 2016. They are now matured enough uh, to be uh, official cloud resources. They basically have uh, TCG and target data co-located already on AWS and Google Cloud. Um, they also allow users to import their own data into the workspace. So you can commingle your data with other uh, TCGA target data in your analysis. And there are a lot of analysis tools and pipelines that are specific for genomic analysis. So if, if you don't have to try to install your own tool or try to get it from somewhere. Um, and so another great thing is now you have a workspace that you can collaborate with your, uh, with your uh, researchers. So, for example, uh, Seven Bridges, uh, they have actually make available over, should I should actually have it on the next slide. Oh, yeah, over 300 uh, tools that they have already put into their, um, to their work, uh, the platform. And what they do is they provide you a visual to link up your workflow. So you can imagine each um, little box is a method. So you can have a BWA MAM as your first step, and then your next step is Picard, and now you can visually do this, arrange it, and easily uh, communicate with your collaborators, hey, this is the method I use, this is the flow of, of, of the analysis. Uh, so this is really great. Uh, and the other thing they have is a Ravix. Uh, actually, Brian may talk about that uh, because Ravix enables you to uh, run workflows that are um, supported by CWL. And yes, I, I've interacted with Summer Bridges. They're really great uh, with their support uh, in answering questions. Um, so I'll just give you that URL, uh, sorry, that email there in case you want to start. Typically, uh, there is free credits to start with. So the, I can't remember how much now, but there is usually some free credits to, to, for you to, um, to start up and play around. Um, so this is my personal impression of the three clouds that, that as I interacted with them. Uh, Seven Bridges really have a great number of tools, uh, having great int uh, graphical interface to do uh, workflows. Um, but at the same time, people, some people don't like uh, graphical interface. And so ISB is more uh, appealing for people who want to use command lines. Uh, and these are different type of users. And they also use a lot of the Google native services already. So if you're already familiar with Google um, or you don't want anything too fancy and get confused, that, that would be a good option. Uh, Fire Cloud, Bro Fire Cloud is interesting because um, they themselves are using this platform for the production run. So you may know that Broad does a lot of sequencing, and they actually use this platform to do their pro uh, production alignment. So they have production level analysis in mind. Um, so it, it, you notice there's a difference there. Um, and so sometimes, also as you know, Broad publishes a lot of methods. Some of them are not available just as open source or a package you can download. However, these tools can be found in FireCloud, so that's one advantage. 
Uh, then academic clouds. Um, so BioNimbus, as I said, is a trusted partner to distribute NCI data at UChicago. So this is one good resource because uh, you can actually get both T GDC data and then the Peacock, some of the Peacock data, the TCJ portion of the Peacock data uh, on that cloud platform. So you got the data co-located. Um, at this point, I won't encourage uh, application to BioNimbus because I know we're, we're at, at capacity, but I would recommend Cancer Genome Collaboratory if, if you're interested in an academic cloud. This is the place that already has the ICGC data, um, and the great thing is is has a very fast connection to you, Chicago, about Nimbus. So that means if you have to download some of the TCGA data to collaborate for analysis, is a fast connection. So this is actually the collaboratory hardware. Uh, that's George over there. Uh, back in November 2015, when we first started, we only had like a rack and a half. Uh, now we have six racks actually by actually as of November, all six racks are full and we have uh, 2,500 cores right now with local disk of 381, no, sorry here, uh, yeah, so uh, block storage, yes, 60 terabytes block storage, but the uh, raw storage of almost uh, with 7.3 7 petabytes. And so basically we will do another expansion this year, so we will hope to expand to uh, 4,600 cores by the end of the year. Um, I think George probably mentioned that a collaborator use all open source systems, so OpenStack, Ceph Storage, these are all open stack, uh, uh, sorry, open source uh, products, so we don't have to pay licenses. Um, so this is sort of how you see where things linked up. Uh, so the, the file sto storage system is in the back that can easily be accessed through uh, APIs that are standardized by Amazon. So meaning that whatever you develop that works on Collaboratory will work on AWS. So this is a nice, uh, nice collaborating is a nice place to start your development, and this is typically what we recommend to people: is like start your development on collaboratory, um, and then as you need to scale up, then you can port your code or your data to Amazon as necessary. Um, in here, basically, we just also want to show that this is easily um, linked to Doc Store to get Docker containers where all the algorithms are. And this is also has a uh, connection to the ICGC data portal. So when you, after you're doing searches, you can easily get the data from the storage system. Um, so just very briefly, this is data that is already in Collaboratory. So there is, um, these are somatic mutations, I believe, structural variants, align reads, uh, and then copy number and structural uh, mutations. So all this data is already in collaboratory. These are the ICGC portion of Peacock, and this is the um, uh, TCJ portion of Peacock's inbound Nimbus. Uh, there are other ICGC data sets um, that are more than just Peacock, and this data is actually over at EGA. So gradually over time, we're in the process of importing all this data to Collaboratory as well so they can reside in one place. Uh, it just takes a little bit of time. Okay, so um, for Collaboratory, you can see that there are, we have currently 31 active projects, uh, 73 users, and just to give you a sense of what people are doing in, in terms of research, people are looking at tumor subtypes uh, using a deep learning, genomic alteration of 3D uh, organization of cancer genome, formation and consequences of encoding mutations, comprehensive uh, um, comparison of primary and metastatic cancer. So this is open to the research community. You can easily go to the site to um, uh, uh, register, get an account. It is based on a cost recovery model, so um, basically based on uh, the cost of replacing hardware over time. We're not even putting uh, staffing cost, We're just replacing hardware over time. We uh, come up with a rec cost recovery model, and it is actually pretty com uh, uh, competitive with AWS. Um, and the, well, 
if you ask me why I would use this instead of AWS, is because um, you're in a community that with other cancer researchers. So the support staff, we the collaborate actually has two support staff. One is George, um, and the other person. So you only have two support staff, meaning any questions you send out there, uh, you just have to give the background ones. They understand what you're trying to do, and so they're very able to help you in your specific uh, scenario. Whereas if you go to AWS, you know every time you have open a ticket, you get someone different um, giving all the background, and they may not understand the kinds of tools that you're trying to do. Whereas you know George has actually run some of these tools himself. Um, so so that's the difference. Um, but of course, when you have to scale up, then that's when you go to AWS, that you can start up you know, 500 machines if you want at the same time to get it done. Uh, but like George said, remember to start small, so do your optimization uh, while you're in development. Uh, so just a little, okay, last couple of things, whereas um, Another reason to support Collaboratory is because it continues to develop tools that are open source to the community. So some of the things they have done is, I know they, they come up with this theme of music, so the entire software package is called Overture, uh, but they have come up with systems for this one is for um, managing uh, the genomic data hosted on cloud storage, so this is sort of the storage system. Song is a metadata uh, tracking system. And then we also develop our own billing system in order to uh, call, do cost recovery. Doc Store is a tool registry um, a tool. And then you have enrollment and data portal. So all these things can be reused by the community if they want to um, uh, set up their own kind of cloud portal. But in terms of science, uh, Collaboratory is also trying to comply with standards like the Global Alliance for Genomics Health. And so one thing uh, I think people are very interested in is to have an API to interrogate uh, variants instead of having to download these VCFs and man manipulate them. Um, so uh, um, Collaboratory has already started a prototype. This is using a 10-node elastic surge. It got very good performance because uh, when they're trying, these are they have indexed 300 million variants, um, and so it took only you know 1,200 milliseconds to get um, to get the results. Uh, that's much faster than you, what you can do with say a SQL database. Uh, so it's nice that this basically this is something that you try to um, develop based on demand from the users. So a lot of these. Uh, work they do is based on user demand to get better software uh, to be integrated into the portal and integrated into the cloud.